Hello, my friends. Welcome back to another great presentation I have planned for you today. I have a really, really special guest. I'm really excited to bring you another platinum presentation. And you might be asking, you know, what is a platinum presentation? A platinum presentation allows us to spend more time with our guests. And that's really fun because you really get to experience them at a different level. Um, rather than being quick 30 minute, 60 minute thing, we've got a little bit more than an hour and a half together today. And uh, that allows us to do a deep dive. And what I encourage you to do is you know have a, a pen and paper handy because we are going to get some uh, some great information out to you and we're going to be talking about publishing today and I know a lot of people wonder you know should I write a book should I not write a book we're going to answer that question but we're going to go a lot deeper than that we're not just going to answer that question we're going to answer the question of what should you publish how should you publish um, what should the book do where does it fit into your career because a lot of people say I'm going to publish a book and become a millionaire off the book sales well that's probably not going to happen however the book itself can be a vehicle to getting you new customers, new clients, and bringing you a lot of new business. And I've had that experience myself, and uh, you know, I want you to have that experience as well. If you haven't yet published a book, or even if you have, uh, it may be time for book number two, or in some cases, book number fourteen. Right? We never quite get to the end of uh, you know our publishing, and I really do believe every one of us has a book in us, in, inside of us somewhere, and it just takes the right motivation, the right inspiration to get that book out, and. Uh, Hopefully, you're going to get that uh, inspiration today with my guest. My guest today is Tara Alamani. And I have to tell you something about Tara. She is one of these people that defies a simple definition, just like, like me in many ways. Uh, she is a multi-award winning author, speaker, business consultant, and publisher, as well as a serial entrepreneur. Um, her most recent company, Emerald Lake Books, is a hybrid publishing company specializing in working with positive people who have a message to share with the world. Now, many of her books have gone on to win international awards and recognition thanks to her published with a purpose framework. We're going to talk a lot about that today because it's very unique and very powerful. Now, in addition to publishing, consulting, writing, and speaking, Tara serves on the board of directors for a Christian Writers Critique Group, acting as both president and chaplain of the group. In her spare time, get this, she's a winemaker, a military mom to two kids, one boy, one girl, um, a stepmom to one lovable mutt, and is owned by a black cat. And boy, oh boy, do I understand that. Tara, welcome to the show. <laughs> Hi, Robert. Thanks for having me. I'm so happy that you're going to be uh, sharing with us uh, publishing with a purpose today. And but before we get there, we're going to that's good. You know, we're going to build up to that a little bit. And what I'd like to do is really um, let's lay the foundation for people who are thinking about should I write a book? Should I not write a book? You know, the people are on the fence. We run into them all the time and they don't even know if they have it in them. Can they really sit down and write 60,000 words? Is it even possible? Maybe we can set the framework for them and help them out a little bit. Certainly. There's, there's all <laughs> sorts of ways to go about writing a book. Um, you know, you can do it yourself. You can sit down and, and do an outline and fill it in. Uh, a lot of people are using the model of uh, blogging to a book. So you write various blog posts that fit into a framework of what you want the book to eventually cover. Um, I actually sometimes use presentations as a means of writing a book. So, for instance, I will pitch a number of different story ideas to podcasts or to uh, interviews and things like that that are geared each one to being a chapter in a book. And when the presentation is done, I'll take the transcript of it and I'll have it transcribed and use that as the basis of material for moving on to uh, writing that chapter and, and refining it from there. Uh, gives me the purpose uh, or the opportunity to test out the material and see how it resonates, how it feels, whether it's authentic or not. Uh, some people, you know, they'll have a ghostwriter or an author coach help them. Uh, we do a good amount of author coaching and, and have a ghostwriter that we work with as well. So there's all sorts of different ways of writing a book. And uh, yeah, it's, it's definitely a, a, a journey, uh, but a neat destination to get to. Uh, being able to say you're an author, I tell you, you go to networking groups. As soon as people hear you're an author, they want to tell you about their story idea or, you know, all these different things. So it's a great way of connecting with people as well. 
It is. And I got to tell you something. When I signed the contract uh, for my book for in 2006 with Wiley, I had just signed the contract. I hadn't done anything yet. I hadn't re- even <laughs> written one word. I, re- I wrote the proposal and then they gave me a contract. And, and I would tell people, yeah, I just signed a contract to you know, publish my first book. And uh, all of a sudden you were elevated to a different stature in their mind. I mean, it was yes. instant. It was like, you know, you look at the experts and you say, well, I'm the expert on motivational marketing. Well, why are the expert? I wrote the book on it. You know what I mean? And it's, <laughs> yeah, it, exactly. it holds a lot of weight in our society. So writing a book is really, really, really a powerful tool. You brought something up. I want to I want to dig a little bit here because um, a lot of people go, well, I don't know where I'm going to get the content from. But you brought it up. And, and you know, so many of us do PowerPoint presentations. Uh, so many of us do podcasts. Or if we're not, uh, you know, the in front of the camera type person or in front of the microphone type person, even blog posts. And Mm -hmm. you mentioned that those are great uh, sort of lead-ins, if you will, to writing your book. Can you expand a little bit on that? Uh, Sure. So you figure typically your chapter of a book is going to be about 1,500 words. Uh, Your blog posts these days go anywhere from 500 to 1,700 words. Uh, So if you think about laying out uh, an editorial calendar that matches the outline of your book, you can essentially use each blog post that you write as a chapter in the book. And it gives you the opportunity to get, you know, comments from people who are reading, find out uh, maybe they have additional stories to share that you can use to expand on the content or, or ideas you hadn't thought of uh, that you can then write about as well. So when you blog your book, um, it, it's actually giving you the opportunity to see how it's going to be received and to fine tune it from there. OK, well, now we're, you just coined a phrase here. Blog your book. I think that's that's your next book. <laughs> I think it exists already. <laughs> I love it. I think it, I think it's I'm, I'm looking down. Sorry, folks. I'm, I'm actually writing notes down because Tara has got so much to share. It's like I know I'm going to have three, four pages of notes here. By, but blog <laughs> your book is brilliant. I, I, I can see people doing that. You mentioned um, a word I want you to explain. You said your editorial calendar. And I don't know that a lot of people understand what that is outside of you know, our industry where you know, we, we think in terms of that. Sure. So oftentimes when you're in business, you want to think about different pieces of content that you're going to put on your your website that keep people coming back. And usually you're using it to educate uh, the people who are visiting your website about the services you offer or about considerations that they may uh, want to uh, take into consideration before they make a decision on certain things. So, for instance, um, we have a lot of blog content on our website that's related to terms and Uh, concepts that people need to understand if they're going to be an author. Uh, So for instance, what is an ISBN number? Uh, Most authors, they start hearing that, but they're not really certain what it is or what it means other than that it's a whole bunch of numbers. Um, There's significance to it. There's ways that it's used. And so we have a blog post on, you know, what is an ISBN? Uh, It works towards SEO because when people are searching on what is an ISBN, they find our blog post and it brings people to our site. But when you write an editorial calendar, what you're doing is saying, all right, here are the terms that I expect people are going to be looking for when I want to appear in front of them, when I want them to find my website. And so I can, I can schedule a calendar of the content that I'm going to write and release that takes our visitors on a journey uh, that educates them to the things that they need to know uh, in order to work with us better. So the editorial calendar is simply charting out what you're going to write when and what it's going to be about and which SEO keywords that you're trying to hit so that the search engines will show your page when people are looking for that information. I love this because you're making it uh, simple enough for anybody to really recognize that they can do it. So the book really isn't exactly the blog post. The blog posts really are uh, kind of like a comedian. He'll go to a lot of comedy uh, clubs and test out new content and see if he yep. gets a laugh out of it. And, you know, they'll keep the best jokes and dump everything else. And over time, they refine it and refine it and refine it and it gets better and better. And then when they finally show up on Johnny Carson, oh, boy, am I dating myself. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, I'm right there with you. <laughs> yeah, they they but they've got a they've got a you know a three minute skit that's really refined and it's only the best of the best and people think man this this person's brilliant but they don't realize all the all the the testing that they've done and yes. the blog posting I think you're what you're bringing up is a really cool uh, you know way of doing this because you can measure response you can measure what pages people are hitting what titles they're responding to what keywords people are mm-hmm. using if you're using Google Analytics to find how are they finding your content how are they finding yeah. your website. Yeah, exactly. 
yeah i i i just you know i congratulate you for sharing this because this is this is <laughs> eye-opening material for a lot of folks who are thinking about uh you know not being able to write a book all right let's go a little deeper you said powerpoint presentations you said um podcasts you're doing interviews uh that there's a phenomenal channel i think for um creating content the podcasts are there's so many opportunities to be interviewed on podcasts today. It's, it's just, it's yes. just overwhelming. Yeah. So, so one of the things that I'm interested in trying to trying out in this next year is I'm in the process of writing my next book, which is called publish with a purpose. And it's, it's something that I know we're going to talk about more uh, as this presentation goes on, but what I'm doing right now is laying out each of the chapters of the outline of the book. And what I'll do is for some of those chapters where they're more educational chapters, I'm going to pitch that particular topic to a podcast and maybe give it two, three, four times on different podcasts, variations on it, and each time get the audio. And then I'm going to have the audio transcribed. And it's going to give me uh, content that I can use for refining that chapter. But it allows me to kind of have the conversations, the back and forth like I'm having with you, uh, that sparks ideas that really helps me feel comfortable with the content before I sit down to to write that final chapter. Uh, and I'm going to do that for a number of the different chapters that are throughout the book. And as a result, I'll, I'll have been trying out this material, but I'll also have been refining it as I'm getting feedback from others, which means that when I take those transcripts and I pick the best of the best of the content in each of them, essentially the chapter's written. Now I just need to fill in or make the transitions from one chapter to the next uh, so that the book is more cohesive. But um, a lot of the hard work is done just in having conversations. I love it. So um, when you're when you're looking at podcasting and you're looking at the audio, how will you know? Uh, is it just sort of an intuitive thing? You'll know what resonates with people, what doesn't? Because my experience is this. If, if I invite friends, family, uh, associates, clients, whatever, to, to watch a podcast interview that I've done or listen to a podcast mm -hmm. interview that I've done, all I get back is brilliant. It was great. Loved it. <laughs> right. And, and well, that's good for the ego, but it doesn't really help me understand if the content was any good. Well, sometimes it's a matter of, of choosing the podcast where you can have much like you and I are having, where we have the back and forth. Uh, so I may not get feedback from the audience so much as inspired by the conversation you and I are having uh, to be able to say, all right, yeah, that really worked or I haven't thought of that. Or let me just dig a little deeper into this piece here because maybe there's more that I can pull out of it. So a lot of it is, is more about how you're feeling about the content you're putting out there. Because one of the things that writing a book does is it really helps you clarify your message. Mm, so say yeah. I shared something with you, right? And, and it, it felt like a lead balloon. <laughs> it's <laughs> like, well, all right, that didn't work. So, so how can I say it differently? How can I approve upon that? And so when you have these back and forth conversations, you're honing in on what your message is and understanding what's clear and what's not. I love it. I, I think that that's brilliant. Okay, so after we're done here, I'll give you feedback on your brilliant content. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> and I won't just tell you how brilliant you are and how excellent you are and how much fun this is. Uh, you know, it's oh, going stop. really fast stop. because stop. it's so much fun. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so well, you've given some ideas now about sort of the foundation that people are wondering about, uh, you know, writing a book and how to do it. You've given them some ideas on doing it. Uh, how about the title of a book? That's that's a big topic that comes up a lot of times. What are some thoughts you have on titling your book? Does a title come first? You know, like we said, blog your book might be a title. I mean, to me, that feels like a title of a book, but maybe that's not how it works. It's, it's kind of funny because um, oftentimes when authors come to us, they already have their title picked out, but they haven't, it's the thing that they felt passionate about and that's, that's the working title they've given it. And they haven't really thought about anybody else's uh, impression of that title or how discoverable that title will be. Uh, we're working on a book right now where the working title was, um, the title of it was heroin, but heroin not as in the drug as in the female hero. And you know, one, one of the things that we discussed with the author was the fact of, you know, imagine being on a podcast and being introduced as the author of heroin if your book title needs to be described so that people understand what it's about, then it's probably not a good title. <laughs> uh, so ultimately the title has been uh, revised to you are a heroine because that's very much about what the book is about. It's about helping women take the heroine's journey. 
it's a retelling of Joseph Campbell's uh, The Hero's Journey uh, from A Hero with a Thousand Faces. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, using You Are a Heroine creates this affirmative title that women are attracted to because it's like, oh, yeah, I am. You know, I'm, I'm quite good at what I do or or I need to hear that more often or, well, I'm not yet, but that's where I want to be. So there's that curiosity factor. So now they pick it up. So title is very important. Uh, you also have to think about title in terms of as a publisher, you know, we, we think about it in terms of SEO uh, because mm -hmm. we want to make yes. sure that it's it's findable both within Google and YouTube. If you've got a book trailer and Amazon, if you're there, whichever retail sites you're on. You want to make sure that it's something that is going to be discoverable. And if you come out with, we had one author come to us with a book title and the book was called My Broken Coconut at the time. And My Broken Coconut reflected the author's sense of humor and people who knew him would recognize it. But somebody who knew nothing about the book and discovered it on Amazon, really wouldn't have any clue what it was about and probably would pass it by very quickly. We ended up ultimately doing some research. We came up with some different ideas. We did a survey of his readership or people who are ideal readers for him mm -hmm. and ended up coming up with the name of uh, What Doesn't Kill You. And the subtitle is The Headache from Hell and How I Recovered. Oh so, boy, I love that. Yeah. And, and so, you know, what doesn't kill you when, when somebody hears the title, what doesn't kill you, they naturally, their psychological response is to finish it. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Right. Right. And that's very much what this book is, is about, is not giving up in the face of adversity. This uh, author had a migraine for three years that could not figure out where it came from. Nothing was helping it. And ultimately, that journey he had to go on to be able to find a cure for it and uh, his, his entire concept in the book through telling his story is to encourage others who are facing hardships, uh, whether it's physical or otherwise, to keep going. Don't take other people's answers as the only answer. You know, keep going until you discover what you feel is the correct answer for you. So your your role in this was really to help uh, take it from the broken coconut, which you're right. If I saw that, it, <laughs> it wouldn't mean anything to me. I would just pass it by. And, you know, does it res does it resonate? Does it not? Uh, mm -hmm. But someone who suffers from migraines like I do, uh, you know, there might be value in, uh, you know, sure. the what doesn't kill you uh, title. Like you said, in your mind, you're trying to finish that sentence. And, you know, mm -hmm. maybe if nothing else, it it'll spike curiosity in you to figure out what the book's about. Exactly. So exactly. that's the work that you do, right? For, for your authors. Yeah, for a lot of our authors. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes they come with, with a title and, and we're fine with it. Uh, there's typically kind of a balance that you look for when it comes right. to your title, subtitle. And, and so uh, typically you want either your title or your subtitle to be short and the other to be longer. Um, or you want them to be somewhat equal. So, um, for instance, the publish with a purpose uh you know that's that's definitely clear on what the content is about it's clear what readers can expect to find in it and so we'll, we'll stick with that even though it's our working title um it ultimately will end up being the title what we haven't spent much time on yet is figuring out what the subtitle is and the subtitle is is going to be something that's going to bring a lot more clarity as to who the right reader is for it so, so my question to you tara if i may interrupt here just for a second sure. Publish with a purpose or publish with purpose? Is it better to be shorter? Because I've heard that titles really should be two words and not longer than two words. For easy to remember, easy to refer, mm -hmm. you know, go look at my book. It's called Motivational Marketing. Easy to remember, just two words, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What do you think? Um, I don't know yet. Uh, titles, you, typically you're looking two to four words. Um, and, and so, or even one word sometimes. I mean, think about all of the different great books that are out there. Blink. <laughs> You know, it's, it's just one word. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, uh, so, well, it's easy to recommend know, it if it's one word. Sure. Yeah, sure. Well, it's also somehow catches your attention more uh, mm -hmm. when it's one yeah. word um, because you really have to think about, all right, so what is this about? You know, and, and uh, when it's more than that, um, it's, it's more explained. Uh, so publish, I don't know. I mean, publish with a purpose, publish with purpose. They're, they're, I don't know. We'll have to play with that. 
You've given me something I mean, to think about, I didn't Robert. mean to put you on the spot. I, I <laughs> want to go back to the, the heroin comment because it's really um, fascinating in our society. You know, when you and I grew up, we saw this and we said, what? This is a pound sign. Yep. What's it yep. called now? Hashtag. Right. You tell a millennial a pound sign, they go, huh? Right. Uh-huh. They have no idea. Yep. Yep. So you're you're right about that is you really have to pay attention to societal changes and and, you know, the way our language has changed. I mean, I go back to um, I left Montreal. I, was, I grew up in Montreal and I left there in 1987. So I speak French, I speak English, but I don't know any of the Internet terms in French because I was never exposed to them. Those words did mm. not exist when I was when I was up there. So yep. now I speak to my cousins up there and they bring up these tech words or, you know, they, they, they've completely <laughs> added this whole new vocabulary and it's like i feel lost sometimes mm-hmm. so it's real mm-hmm. important to pay attention to that right like heroin was you're right it's a it's a female hero it's a heroin but now it's yeah. a horrible drug that's destroying our youth i mean what you know so you do yeah. have to pay attention to that because it does change it does it does i'm, I'm and- really glad to have you um uh, you know, working with the authors in this way, because, you know, so many of us, we don't know so many of the little intricacies. We may have an idea or a desire to write a book, but I mean, if you don't know some of these things. Yes. You know, that's 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 the biggest issue that we find a lot of times. Uh, we have self-published authors who are just struggling to figure out a whole industry. You know, th- they know that they want to save their money, invest their time to write their book and, and get it out there. But there's so many different decisions that are made along the way and research that's done to make sure that ultimately the book is positioned in the best way possible for discoverability. We have uh, a client that we're getting, well, the You Are a Heroine book. Uh, We're getting ready to do uh, that soon. It's going to be released in the next month or so. And she actually had started out working with Create Space Design, uh, their design services. And uh, then one Monday morning, she woke up and she found out on Friday, Create Space Design was closing down and she had to finish her book by then. <laughs> and a l- little bit of a panic. <laughs> uh, Nothing like a little and, motivation, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and so um, she had been at a conference later that evening or a networking event and she met a friend of ours, uh, Patty Lennon. And uh, so Patty had told her, oh, you're working on a book and, and, and you really need to talk to Emerald Lake Books. You need to talk to our friends there uh, because they're going to help you figure out all the stuff that, that you know, you're, you're struggling with. And even though Susanna's book, she's the author, Susanna Lillard, even though her book isn't released yet, uh, she's already telling people about her experience in working with us because there's so many things that she didn't know she needed to do or she uh, wasn't even aware were oppor- opportunities or options for her. Uh, so, you know, having the guidance, uh, she would have gone out with a book called Heroin and then been left trying to have to explain what her book is about every time it was mentioned. And uh, that, that's just not a good place to be in. <laughs> no, not at all. And especially if you're on the radio a lot. <clears throat> that's one mm-hmm. of the things about the, the short title book is, you know, the, if you're on the radio being interviewed, uh, people are driving in their car and they need to remember the mm-hmm. title. They're not going to remember a longer title. And it, it's harder, I guess, when your your title like that heroine is, is one that needs a lot of explanation and people yep. aren't getting it, you know, and that's that's really true. So I'm seeing a lot of value um, where I may not have recognized the value of having a publisher Mm -hmm. Um, in the past. I'm seeing a lot of value here. Um, I got to be honest, working with uh, John Wiley and Sons, I got none of this. Yep. This was not part of it at all. They basically signed a contract with me, handed me a giant check and said, you know, you got 16 weeks, produce a book. (laughs) And I said the chapter a week is how I did that 16 chapters because I had 16 weeks. I made 16 chapters. That's the way I figured it out. Uh, You know, not not based on much other than, uh, you know, I have an audience and and they thought we could sell the book to the audience that I had. And that was the end of the discussion as far as marketing goes. But I so love your approach. and, And, you know, you brought up you've been using the word research a lot. And mm-hmm. you, you've just done a survey and I took that survey and I know a lot of other people have taken that survey. I've shared it on my Facebook timeline. And um, you're doing work that, you know, a person writing a book is never going to do or even know how to do. And right. so you're, start, you're starting off on a different foundation than, uh, you know, I think many other publishers. And that, why I really wanted to have you here was for that, because you bring a different uh, perspective to this. We do. You know, the thing that Emerald Lake Books uh, does that's so different than most other publishing houses is that we blend business coaching with publishing. Uh, You know, you mentioned in my intro that I'm a serial entrepreneur. I started my first company at 19. 
Uh, so I've had a lot of, this is uh, Emerald Lake Books is my third business. So I've had a lot of experience with starting up businesses, but also with understanding how they work. And one of the challenges when you're taking a book and trying to use it to build a business or a brand is understanding how to use it effectively. Most people think, oh, I write the book and the bulk of the money I'm going to get is from book sales. And so I've got a residual income coming in. Well, that's setting the bar real low. Uh, first of all, first-time authors, the, the average first-time author sells 100 copies the lifetime of their book. So you're not going to make a lot of money just from book sales. You want to think about the other ways that the book can be used. And so that's a lot of what we do in working with our authors is we have this published with a purpose framework where we set some goals with the author very, very early on. And we have three primary goals that we look at. One is about the goal that the author has for the reader. So what is the reader going to get out of it? How is it going to influence them or what action will they be able to take or how will they feel when it's done? We look at the goal for the author. Uh, where actually the author will spend some time reflecting on what do they want the book to accomplish for their business. And lastly, what's the book's overall in impact? And that can be things like, you know, maybe they want to give some of the proceeds to a charity, uh, or maybe they want to have, you know, start a movement, all these different things. But this survey that we do, we do because we're looking for which problems are business owners facing so that we can show them how the book can, how having a book can solve those issues. So this survey that you're talking about, we put out there, we did it a couple of years ago as well. And the results are remarkably still pretty much the same. Uh, and it's a single question of what's your worst business problem. And we list a number of different things that uh, different bus uh, small business owners have told us in the past. And we ask each person who takes it to rank it from not at all relevant to painfully relevant. And so it's kind of a five point scale. And it's really interesting. Some of the things that we, we you know, people respond to or you know, I hate selling. I put that in there because that was mine. <laughs> My biggest issue in business is I hate to sell. Uh, you know, I need more leads. I need better brand visibility. My branding's confusing. All these different things. I need to improve my cash flow. And so in doing this survey and putting it out there, uh, it's really interesting because this year, um, and, and similar to two years ago, uh, we had more than a third of the people that responded have been in business for 10 years or longer, and more than half have been in business for five years or longer. So these aren't newbies in terms of you know, what issues they're facing. They've been dealing with them for some time. And two thirds of the respondents are 45 years or older, so they're not new to figuring out what business is about. Uh, they've probably been in the business world for you know, 20 years at least. Uh, about 60% of the respondents are solopreneurs. Um, and, and when it comes down to it, the top three results that we saw, which are still the same from a few years ago, are I need more leads, I need to improve my cash flow, and there aren't enough hours in the day. And as a close fourth, there's I need better brand visibility. Now, for me, if you have better brand visibility, you're going to have more leads and you're going to improve your cash flow. <laughs> so it's really interesting to see that brand visibility, it comes forth of the of those. Um, but for me, when we when we go through all these things, each one of these issues are something that are easily solvable by having a book. And so when we're working with our authors, we're finding out what's their worst business problem. And how can we design and position and leverage this book to help address that issue. And at the same time, it's going to it's going to take care of some of the others as well. I'm, I'm already, you know, done with the uh a whole page of notes here and we're only you know a half hour in i got a full page of notes already you're sharing so much good stuff i'm really appreciating um you have having you here so the survey um results are kind of interesting because uh one third of the people you surveyed and i don't know if you specifically selected them or not but one third were in business 10 years or more two thirds yep. 45 years or older so they're kind of in our, our generation um mm -hmm. gen x or or you know the trailing baby boomers yeah, sixty percent solopreneur. That was interesting too, because um, I'm thinking that's a that's a big market segment that is actually expanding uh, more and yes. more because a lot lot less people are uh, over the last generation. We've kind of figured out that you know working for some company is not um, security, 
And I think mm-hmm. a lot of people have decided, to, you know, they either got to have a, what they call a side hustle today that's new. <laughs> you know, yeah, the yep. second stream of income is probably the way you and I would say it, but it's called a side hustle today. Got to change our mm-hmm. vocabulary a little bit because we date ourselves. And, um, <laughs> you know, a lot of people are, are looking at that and saying, OK, what do I need to do to get out there? And I know I started thinking about doing a book when I was uh, still in corporate America. And I left corporate America back in 1995. So it's been some time for me as well. But I remember mm-hmm. starting to think uh, in terms of writing a book back then. I had ghostwritten at that time a book for the guy I was working for, the company I was working for. And I was ghostwriting articles that were being published in uh, Direct Mail Magazine, DM, uh, DM News, and, and stuff like that mm-hmm. on a weekly basis. So I was doing sure. a lot of writing already. And I remember that started to come up. So it's interesting that you're, you're reaching out to that same kind of marketplace even now. And, and I'm talking back 1995. Even now, people are starting to have the same idea and think, well, I need to do a book. I think a book is going to be really helpful. But your point of and I'll let you get I'll let you get a word in here. I'm just I'm just like processing this stuff and really loving it. But the f- average author, the first time author sells 100 copies of the book. That is discouraging. Over its lifetime, yeah. Over its lifetime. That's discouraging. Yeah, it is. It yeah. is. And yet, uh, L- L- Lionel Binney, who is the author, uh, is one of our authors, and he's going to be on Marketing Thunder later on this week. Um, Lionel, when he came to us, you know, he came from a very specialized niched, niched industry. Uh, he talks about uh, retail and marketing in the food service industry, you know, and so he's, he's a agency for there, but he's moving into the consulting realm. He wanted to expand beyond the food service so that he had more lead opportunities. Uh, And when he came to us with the idea for a book, we actually spent a good year batting back and forth what exactly the book should consist of in order to accomplish what he wanted to do. And ultimately, he ended up writing a book called The Future of Omnichannel Retail, which as extremely niche as it sounds, has sold over 100 copies in the first 45 days because of the work that we did with him, the way we positioned it, the way we we worked on it. And as a result, he's had people write from Singapore saying that they're using this. Uh, he's been invited by his alma mater to come speak to a marketing class in October. And we had a university, uh, Bowling Green State University has reached out to us and they're using it as a textbook in their marketing program. You know, so so somebody who was very niche, who wants to move into the consulting area as opposed to an agency area, suddenly he has visibility he never had before uh, because he had a very small mailing list. He had no social media platform whatsoever. Uh, So properly positioning it, designing it in a way that his concepts are out there and they're clearly articulated so that they're something that other people can apply to their own businesses uh, is making a huge difference in his. And I, I would think that uh, if being used as a textbook in a college, he'll sell more than 100 copies, more than 100 students are going to be taking those classes. Sure. Well, yeah. he, as I said, in the first 45 days, he already sold more than 100. It, it, it came out May 25th, so it hasn't been all, out all that long, but he's sold a few hundred at this point. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's one of those things that he's gotten over, and, and all of our authors do uh, when they work with us because of the way that we set things up and the way we educate them because oftentimes with a publisher, I don't know if you experienced this with Wiley, but once your book comes out, you're left to do the marketing and the sales. They set up the distribution channels, but the idea is you do the bulk of the work yourself. Uh, We stay in close contact with our authors long after the book has been published. Uh, We let them know about interview opportunities we hear of or about award uh, uh, contests. And we do encourage all of our authors to uh, submit their books for award contests. Because from our standpoint, if you look at becoming an Amazon bestseller, there's almost a formula you can use for becoming an Amazon bestseller. So so you're gaming the system. Uh, But if you submit your book to a juried award competition, and your book is being evaluated by business professionals, librarians, book retailers, you know, industry folks, and it comes across as, you know, a gold medal winner in a contest, uh, especially an international book award suddenly the clout and the leverage that comes, if you're being considered for a speaking opportunity or a consulting gig and you're able to say, I'm an award-winning author, oh, yeah. that's a totally Big different time. thing. Yep, yep, absolutely. Yep. So I want to talk a little bit about the content um, 
of the book. There are books that, and you mentioned this, the, you know, the goal of the, of the book, you had three different things listed, you know, what's it going to do for the reader? What's it going to do for the business and, and what kind of impact it's going to create? See, I am taking notes. Um, <laughs> um, so one of the things when I, when I think about the goal for the business, what I hear oftentimes, and I, I, I spend a lot of time with people who are marketers and, and, you know, entrepreneurs and digital marketers and, you know, coaches, that kind of thing. They think about writing a book and they think about, well, it's going to get me more clients. And what they think about, I think incorrectly, and correct me if I'm wrong here, is the content of the book ends up being really a long sales letter. Uh, T. Harv Eker mm-hmm. comes to mind with his book that he wrote. Uh, if you read the book, it's basically a no content book. It's a sales letter. It's an yeah. 84 page, yeah. whatever it was, uh, sales mm-hmm. letter. That's not yep. what you're talking about. No, not at all. Okay. Not at all. From, from our standpoint, uh, we're, we're talking about what are you building your business on? So if you have a message, if you have a service, if you have a product, what you want to do isn't sales so much as education and inspiration. You want to basically let your reader see what the possibility is for them. So one of the first exercises that we take our, our readers through or our authors through before we even start editing a book is we have them do a dear reader exercise, which is something that we learned from a friend of ours, uh, Justin Spiesman. Uh, he's a ghost writer that we know. And the dear reader exercise essentially has the author sit down and write a letter to the reader. And I did this uh, for Publish with a Purpose. And it is a very uh, interesting process because it becomes very visceral, very emotional. Uh, you're writing a letter to the reader that basically says you understand who they are. You understand what their needs and their wants are. And you've written something in order to help them accomplish that, in order to help them secure what it is that they want to have for themselves. And you give a little bit in the letter about who you are and and why you're able to provide this information. And the letter finishes with a promise to the reader. And essentially it says that if you're going to invest your time and money in reading this book, this is what you'll get out of it. And that provides the entire basis that we then edit the book around because we want to make sure as we're editing it that the author's content is meeting that promise. And if the author's content as it exists currently doesn't take the reader on the journey they've been promised, then we work on a development edit. We help flesh it out in such a way that we modify some of the content in order to make sure that it can accomplish that. Uh, So it very much has to be about the reader, not about the author. And it's just a matter of helping them then be able to connect the dots to say, all right, if I want more, then I need to talk to this author. All right, Tara, thank you so much. This was great. We really appreciate you being here because you just gave us the million dollar idea. (laughs) And just really, you know, what else do you need? This is brilliant. I love this, by the way. Thank you for sharing that. Um, the Dear Reader. You know, I wanted to share real quick. If, if people are interested, we, uh, we are putting together a workbook that we're giving away as a gift to those who are uh, watching this call today. Oh, uh, that it covers a little bit about this exercise as well as a few other uh, things that we do in order. So we have a, a Dear Reader exercise. We have a Finding Your Market exercise that we do. And we have a Dear Author exercise, which is another very, very emotional process, <laughs> but uh, very good because the thing about the Dear Reader exercise Exercise is it lets you know when you're done editing the book and when the book is ready for the reader. The Dear Author exercise lets you know what your marketing plan needs to be. And so if anybody is interested in getting a copy of this workbook, we are giving it as a gift today to uh, people participating. So if you go to emeraldlakebooks.com slash marketing thunder, you'll be able to uh, download a copy there. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna have to put that link in here so we have it. Um, EmeraldLakeBooks.com slash Marketing Thunder. Yep. I'll put that on there um, uh, at the at the bottom of the video so people have that link as well. So the free workbook actually covers more than just the Dear Reader letter. It does. It, it I does. love it. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so that's your hundred thousand dollar gift you've just given somebody. That's that's exactly. amazing. Um, that alone. You know, I think is brilliant from a lot of perspectives because, you know, the author doesn't necessarily know. Maybe they have a message. Maybe they're bubbling over with something they really want the reader to know. But the reader may not know why they need to know that message. And I think what you've done mm-hmm. with this Dear Reader letter is really help them flesh out why they need to know this message, why this information exactly. is important, why it will, will help them. And, and why this book is going to answer the questions better or differently than another book just like it. Brilliant. 
Uh, next question for you is one that I hear quite often. Uh, if I am a coach, trainer, marketer, business owner, whatever, and I've come up with a solution to what have you, whatever problem people would normally have, I put that solution in a book and the book is sold on, you know, Amazon, uh, for nine 99. I'm giving away my best stuff for $10 and I'm probably making a dollar or two off that sale. Why mm -hmm. would I do it? number of different reasons. Okay. Uh, so one of the things that you can do in that book, keep in mind book sales aren't where you're going to build your business. Book, The book is providing visibility for your business and what you do. Uh, so you put your best content in there and in the content, you're going to put opportunities for them to get further information from you. So for instance, um, if there is a template that they can work with, you're going to include a link to be able to download that from your website. And of course that helps you build your mailing list uh, because it's gonna be sent via autoresponder. They have to give your name and email address. So that gives you the opportunity to then prolong the conversation with them, um, continue to, to build on the relationship that you've established. But the other parts that you're going to be doing I've lost track of the question. <laughs> the, the other parts that you're going to be, yeah, well, be doing you're putting, is you're taking... You, you're, you're, you're you're taking you want to put all your content in there, right? You don't want to put your best stuff in the book and give it away for, you know, what essentially is $2 in profit. Sure you do, because what you're going to do is you're going to show how incredibly complex it is. <clears throat> and you're going to give them information that they're going to understand the entire process and they're going to understand it to the point of saying, I need help. I need somebody to guide me through this. I need somebody that I trust to help me figure this all out because I see that there's a lot more to it than I ever realized. It's like people uh, self-publishing a book. They, they put it out there and they're happy if they sell 50 copies because that's a huge deal to them. They don't realize that they could have sold 500 copies had they done something differently. So they've, they've, if they figure it out on their own, that's, that's great. Um, because those aren't necessarily the people who are going to benefit from your coaching the most. But if they, they see how much is involved and they want to work with you directly, you've now taken time to build a trust relationship with them because they're the, they've read your content, they've connected with you, you've resonated with them. They've actually self-selected if they follow up with you. And it's much less of a sales process if somebody's reaching out to you after having read a book than it is if you've got a cold call with somebody or you meet somebody at a networking meeting because they feel like they know you already. But in addition, you can always provide uh, group coaching or a video course or tangential content that gets them to engage with you and purchase other things as well. So there, there's all sorts of things. You have to think of the book as the lead in, not the destination. All right. So in marketing speak, uh, one thing we hear more often than not is we say, uh, you know, you want to give them the what and the why, but you never want to teach them the how you want them to pay for the how. Is that accurate, too, in uh, doing a book like this? Uh, the book that I actually uh, wrote first to build my business uh, was called The Plan That Launched a Thousand Books. And it was a do it yourself guide to creating your own book marketing plan. <laughs> And in it, one of the things that makes it stand out from other books in the marketplace that are similar to it is the fact that I talk about the how. I recommend the tools and the services that I recommend using for building your, your marketing plan and for executing it. Uh, the challenge with it is if the how changes over time, you need to be committed to updating that content on a regular basis so that it stays current. Uh, I've already done two editions of the plan that launched a thousand books and was preparing to do a third one when I realized that it really wasn't the market that I was targeting anymore. And so I opted not to do the third edition of the plan. Uh, but over time now it's becoming, it still has relevant content in it, but it's not as current as it could be. So yeah, if you're, if you're um, selling the how-to part, uh, certainly you can update that because it'll be in a membership site or what have you. I was thinking yep. back to my time with Wiley and how they, they frowned upon having links in the book. And mm -hmm. they really didn't want a lot of links. And they, they said, in the last chapter, I can put links, but not throughout the book. I couldn't spread them throughout the book. And I'm thinking, okay, so then the, real, the only real reason they're doing this book is to make money off the book sales, which, by right. the way, my royalties were 75 cents a copy of the book, a book sold. And the book was retailing for $24.95. Oh, right? Ouch. <laughs> yeah, ouch. And, and then, then all the marketing's on you. And, uh, you know, they got me one radio interview, which I, I 
it worked well. I mean, I sold my book was selling it. That was at 300,000 rank and on amazon.com. And I was mm -hmm. on a radio program in both Houston and Dallas. They were, they were simulcasting to both cities at the same time. I was on for 15 minutes and an hour later, the book was 87 overall on Amazon. Wow. You know, that, so that was a pretty good interview. <laughs> that was, a, it was fun. It was, you know, it was what it needed to be. It did, the, but I, I wanted more of those. You know, I got hungry for it. Give sure. me more, give me sure. more. But that's the only thing they ever did for me as far as that went. And, um, yeah, so I was thinking about that. Wow. No links, no, no callbacks. You know, you could have links mm -hmm. in the final chapter. How many people actually get that far in the book? That's another question. You know, they may read the first yep. few chapters, put it aside, get distracted by another book like I do. <laughs> it's like never get to the end of it. So, um, well, here, here, yeah. here's a neat, neat tip. We don't do it as often as we should, but I heard this. I don't even remember from whom, but a podcast I was listening to at some point in time is, you know how on Amazon you can use that look inside feature to be able to get a quick uh, yes. skim of, of what's what the content is. Uh, somebody that I was listening to recommended that actually you put your most important or most valuable link within the first few pages of the book. So say between the copyright page and the table of contents or something along those lines so that it's actually visible when people go to look inside. And so if you want to build your Facebook group, for instance, you know, you can have an invitation to, you know, you want to learn more about this topic, come join my Facebook group, put the link in there. And suddenly, even if the book is selling or not, if people are just interested in it and taking a peek at it, they're going to find out about your Facebook group. They may decide not to buy the book and just go join the group, but it's a connection. Yeah, you see, that's why they need to hire you because you're thinking outside the box here. Who would think about that, right? And most people wouldn't <laughs> even give that second thought. So basically, you're, you're attracting people who are not even actually reading the book. They're just taking a peek inside, deciding whether or not they want to buy the book. And there's a link already to you know the Facebook group. They get yep. into the Facebook group. They might be interested more in the content and the people that the, you know, the author is attracting. And they might decide, hey, this, is, this makes sense. And uh, mm -hmm. you know they'll jump on board and get the book at that point. Exactly. Brilliant. I love it. I love it. <laughs> Okay, so the book is not necessarily uh, a sales letter. You want to have no. good content. You want to have your best stuff. Um, so you're kind of explaining this. I'll, I'll use an analogy uh, of, uh, you know, trying to promote a movie. You know, we have the trailer for the movie and what normally happens in the trailer. How many times have you seen a movie and said, well, I didn't really need to see the movie because you know, the trailer <laughs> had the best scenes in it. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Right. And that is and usually what you're, you're disappointed. <laughs> well, literally. Right. So, I mean, you know, you look at the movies and, and that's how they promote themselves. They, they sometimes put the best lines, the best one liners in the in the trailer. So you go, ha, that was funny. I hope there's more. And you go watch exactly. the movie and you realize, well, there really wasn't. But that's a little bit of a mm -hmm. disappointment. That's not what we're encouraging. But you are no. encouraging putting some of your best stuff forward in the book so that people know that um, you have a lot to offer. And I think uh, one of, the, I think one of the, the, the ideas here is that a, a person is a one trick pony, mm -hmm. you know, and they put their best stuff in the book and they've got nothing else. It's probably not yep. a good idea. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Unless you can use that, uh, you know, concept that you've taught them, you've taught them how to do it themselves but you're now giving them the opportunity to work with you as a consultant where they can leverage your ability to apply that. So, you know, going back to Lionel's book again, he has this amazing concept uh, of a, a two access framework for figuring out when you're marketing a product or a service, what kind of product and service do you have and what is the consumer expectation for how to encounter it? And, you know, he talks about the fact that not all retail is going to go online as much as there are plenty of things that are going to be purchased on that line. There's some things that will always resist that move because the customer exp expects a certain experience. You're not going to go online to buy a diamond engagement ring. You know, that, that's part of the process is going in and, and looking at all the different options and varieties. So you look at those different things. And so he outlines the entire two access framework in his book you can apply it to your own product. You don't need him for anything unless you want his intelligence, his wisdom, his experience, uh, his out of the box thinking to figure out how to apply this so, so that you can stand out from everybody else that you're in competition with. So you can still put your best content in there and not have significantly more to share really beyond it, but it's the application of it now that becomes your business. 
I love it. Okay. Well, that makes that makes a lot of sense. I think there's uh, an opportunity to say, here's the content. And, you know, if the person has questions, which they often will, because a lot of mm-hmm. the stuff we're sharing is not simple stuff. You know, yes. let me let me show you how to tie your shoes. Probably not going to have many questions, right? Uh, <laughs> let me show you how to build your know, business. I don't know, funny ears and around the tree? Or? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> right, so if a person is trying to build a business and using a marketing strategy, or let me show you how to advertise on Facebook, or, they're going to have questions. They're going to probably want uh, a little hand-holding. Not everybody is a DIY person, right? Exactly. I think that's what, exactly. that's what you're alluding to here. So share your best stuff, share your brilliance. And I look at a book the way I look at a podcast interview or I look at, uh, you know, when I was interviewed on the radio, really what my uh, intent there was, this is an audition. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, uh, the audition is I want to be the author that you read. And that's what I was that I was going for. I said, I want you to read my book because here I have a lot of knowledge to share. And exactly. I really got on the radio and that's what I did to start dumping a lot of a lot of information. And the radio host was so impressed. He had me back, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. and it's like he, because normally you don't get that. You get a promotion. Right. right. Well, in my right. book, this is what I wrote. Well, when you buy my book, this is no, I didn't do that at all. I answered mm-hmm. his questions. I got into you know good conversation with him and was really open to sharing a lot of content. And I got to tell you, that does work. The, the more you are open to sharing your content, the more people go, wow, brilliant. And, you know, they do want more. They naturally come forward without you necessarily needing to sell. So and they want to have conversations with you, you know, and that, that's that's the uh, the neat thing. One of the books that we did uh, may sound like it's a little bit outside of this because it, it's uh, a book about a Danbury about a state fair. Uh, so it's a history book called The Life and Times of the Great Danbury State Fair. And so you think about something that's very local, uh, historical, probably not a huge audience for you would think, but we've sold copies of that book from Maine to Florida and all this far uh, west of Chicago. We're in Connecticut. Uh, so, you know, huge readership of this book. We sold over almost, uh, almost 1,500 copies at this point in time. But the book itself, the author had a goal that he wanted to reach and he liked our publish publish with a purpose framework and the reason he did he wrote the book was because he was the grandson of the last owner and when his grandfather passed away the fairgrounds went into uh his executors needed to um handle the estate and their fiduciary responsibility was to come up with whatever disbursement of that property was going to generate the most cash for the estate and that's that's the way those things go and so 12 hours before the fairgrounds were being sold, our client found out. And yet he's been blamed all these years for, for being greedy because the property was sold to a developer for a mall. So went from something that had been around for over 150 years that people absolutely loved and to build a mall. And, and a lot of people have been furious with him over the years. And so he wanted to tell the rest of the story. And so in, in publishing this book, you know, he was able to fill in those gaps and it had, you know, just, just the readership was amazing on this. And there was a reason that I went here. (laughs) What did you say before this? (laughs) Well, you know, we were talking about the purpose of the book and, and really taking the reader beyond just the content in the book and being able to say, Hey, I need to hire you. I need to be part of, uh, you know, that conversation with you one-on-one. And, you know, this, this, uh, the Danbury Fair one is kind of interesting because it was completely, like you said, it's a different purpose here. This is, I want to tell my side of the story, yes. which you see a lot of political books. I mean, a lot of political books yep. are really about that. It's like you hear what you hear on the media and then the person who is the subject of whatever decides to write a book to tell their side of the story. Yeah, we have another one that's, that's like that as well. That was a totally different subject, but the 143rd in Iraq is another book that we did where it was very much the author wanting to share his side of the story. He was a master sergeant for the 143rd Military Police Company of the Connecticut National Guard. And in 2003, 2004, they were sent over to Iraq to train the Iraqi police force. The problem is that they were sent over with insufficient resources. They didn't have enough equipment. They didn't have enough clothing. They didn't have enough people. Uh, the resources were, were completely understaffed. And they were responsible, responsible for training a police force in a country that is very different than our own and not necessarily being welcome there either. And one of the things that happened is when they all came back, um, most of them went back to their everyday life. Being National Guard, it wasn't like they were career military. That was, you know, people 
uh, thank them for their service and different things like that. Uh, there were a lot of people who didn't know what happened over there. And there were some Purple Hearts and a lot of lot of different things that had happened. They had to pull together hillbilly armor for their cars just to be able to have enough armor on the cars to keep from being injured as they went out and did, did their duties. So he ended up writing this book called The 143rd in Iraq that chronicled the time over there based on diary entries that he had written while he was there and the different things they encountered, the lack of resources they had. And his main goal was to make sure that these heroes uh, didn't, th th that their story was told, that people understood what they'd been through. But he also wanted the Connecticut government to understand their decisions about how cutbacks impact people who are serving overseas. And so in working with him and understanding that his main goal was to get the story out there, it enabled us to then plot out what we needed to do in terms of how we positioned it, did publicity, who we sent copies to, all of these different things. And ultimately, he ended up being uh, invited for a point of pri personal privilege to the state Senate floor to be introduced to the Connecticut State Senate and Congress. Wow. Which was huge. Wow. Yeah, so I can see how the book really, really plays a role in that. So it's a different use for it. Um, let's get back to talking about the entrepreneurs, the, uh, the, the business owners, those people who are, uh, you know, trying to build a business and, you know, gee, where am I going to find the time to write a book? I've got, you know, bills to pay. I've got clients to serve. I've got, you know, websites to build, autoresponders to tweak, and, and I've got a funnel I got to build, you know, and it's like, you've got all this going on. Um, yep. Uh, you know, where do you find the time to, uh, to sit back and actually write the book? Well, like I said, you can think about how you're going to do double du duty for some of these things. If you're building your brand, you're probably having conversations with people. You're probably writing blog content. You're probably on podcasts. So think about how you can reuse that, that content if you do have audio recording. So oftentimes what I'll do is, is uh, I'm a single parent. And so when I had to drive my kids around, uh, to take them different places when they were younger. Uh, oftentimes I had an empty car one way. And, and so I took a digital recorder and I would just start talking about whatever the subject is that I wanted to be writing about. And, you know, I take the digital recorder home and have the audio transcribed and, and there was a blog post or there was a chapter. Uh, so there are ways of doing this. Um, Oftentimes, you know, I'll, I'll set up my, my digital recorder on my iPhone while I'm washing dishes. I'm talking away about different ideas I'm having. Uh, there's a lot of transcription services out there. Temi is a good one. It costs um, 10 cents a minute. Uh, so, you know, that, that's a good one for using, uh, transcribing the content you've got. Uh, it's inexpensive. And, you know, so there are, there are ways of doing things. I think one of the things you and I both know, being serial entrepreneurs, is that, you know, if, if you have something you want to accomplish, you find ways and means of doing it. Absolutely. What's the, the web address of that, that transcription service? Uh, Temi, T-E-M-I dot com. T-E-M-I dot com. I'm going to put a link there as well so people can find that. Ten cents a minute is cheap. It's usually a dollar a minute. Yep. Is what rev, I is minute, but, yeah. um, rev is a dollar a minute, but rev is a dollar a minute, right? Rev.com, com, R E V dot com is another one that uh, is yep. recommended a lot in the marketing community. Um, I want to get into um, the publishing with a purpose framework. I know we've probably been covering it already, but it would be really nice to kind of like, okay, let's put our finger on this now. Let's get real specific on what this is, how you work with the authors, how you take them through the, all these different processes and all these different steps. Um, so that's not so overwhelming for them so that they can actually walk through it and walk away with a, a book. That's not just a published book, which a lot of publishers will do like Wiley did for me. I got the book published. It was beautiful, right? I got this, you know, I got, I, I think they gave me 20 copies. They sent me a box of, of books. And, and that was the end of it. They, they, mm -hmm. uh, aside from one radio interview, you know, they, would, they would check in every <laughs> every quarter. They would check in and say, how are the promotions going? Mm -hmm. And that was yep. the end of it. But you're much different. So let's talk about how you work with authors specifically, because I think that would be the next uh, the next thing. You know, someone's thinking about I want to do this. And, and where do I even start? Sure. So oftentimes when we're working with authors, they, they already at least have a manuscript or a por portion of a manuscript done. Uh, sometimes, though, they don't have anything. They've got an idea. 
Um, and so what we do is make sure that we, we pair them up with the different services they're going to need. Do they need a ghost, ghost writer uh, like you? Maybe you need an author coach just to keep you accountable and, and set up regular times of when you're going to meet to make sure that like you did with Wiley, you get your 16 chapters in 16 weeks. Uh, there's different ways of doing that. But if you've got a manuscript already set up, um, really what we're doing at that point in time is understanding your business and how the book is going to play a role in your business. Uh, are you going to have it as part of a funnel? If it's part of a funnel, is it the beginning of it? Is it in the middle? Uh, where in the funnel does it exist? What follows after it? Uh, if you have you know, services or products or courses that you want to try and transition people from the book into those upper level pro uh, products that you have or services that you have, we need to understand all of that. Uh, then, like I said, we go through this dear reader exercise to understand what your goal is for the reader's uh, experience of the book. And when we're doing our editing, we're keeping your goals for the reader and what you're trying to accomplish for your business in mind as we're going through the editing. So we're looking for opportunities as to uh, ways you can strengthen things. Uh, maybe it's uh, inserting a case study of, of a client that you've ha helped after you talk about a specific way of doing business so that people can self-identify of, you know, yeah, that's, that's, that's like me. Uh, this book, you, uh, you Are a Heroine, that we were talking about earlier, uh, the author interviews three different heroines and how they've followed this journey in their own life. And the heroines that were chosen, actually one focuses on dramatic changes she made in her personal life. Another had a significant medical crisis and how that impacted her life and her journey. Another takes a uh, career change, a totally drastic career change in order to find happiness in her life. So when you put those case studies in and allow the reader to go through and read the content and understand how these case studies were impacted by the process, then it gives people the opportunity to identify and say, yeah, that one really resonates with me. I'm struggling with that right now, too. So we make sure as we're reviewing the book that all of that is available. We have opportunities for, we, we, don't, we don't overdo this, but we make sure that there's a few different opportunities in the book for the reader to download a bonus material or additional resources or listen to audios of the heroine interviews. You know, there's, there's only portions of the interviews that are in the book. You want to hear the full audio? Here, you can go here and download it there. Uh, so we look for different things like that that are all intended to enhance the reader's ex experience. Yeah. The benefit for you is, yes, you get an email address and can extend the relationship that you've got there. But it's all about making sure that the reader is getting as much material as they possibly can. Because uh, my friend Shep Hyken talks about, you know, customer service. You have to be amazing. Uh, so don't just give them what they expect. Give them more. And so we try and find ways of how are you going to give them more in the book? And so when we're doing that, uh, the book is ready. We design it in such a way that we're making sure that it stands out in the marketplace. Uh, so we have a whole cover design thing that we do of understanding what category it's going to go in and what consumer expectations are for the look and feel of a book in that category. But then we do something a little bit extra to make sure that it stands out, that it pops. Uh, so we spend a good amount of time on, on the design work there. Um, about that time as we're getting close to the book being ready and, and designed, we spend a good amount of time with the author on this dear author exercise that we talked about. And that's, that's another letter that's written, but it's you 18 months in the future writing to yourself now about what's been accomplished and how you feel about it and what changes that's brought in your business. And the reason we do that is that it gives us a better understanding of what the marketing component needs to be for launching this book so that you're on the right tra trajectory. Uh, I don't know if you've ever read uh, Jim Stovall's Millionaire Map. I have But not. in there, he, oh, he has this, it, it's a great book, but he talks about the fact that you should never accept a map from somebody who hasn't been where you want to go. And so in doing so, what we want to do is we want to make sure that when you write this to your author letter and you're envisioning what your goal is for your business with this book, that you're putting together a map that has the input of somebody who's been there. And so we make sure, you know, we're using tried and tested um, 
processes for being able to accomplish what you're trying to accomplish. And if we haven't done it ourselves yet, we talk with people who have. We make sure that we get the resources in place to make sure that you have the roadmap you need uh, to get where you want to go. And so this, this visioning letter that is the dear author letter really helps us make sure that we're on the right track with what you want to accomplish with the business. From there, you know, we, we make sure that we're putting in place uh, publicity opportunities and launch opportunities and all these different things to make sure that when you go through this, we continue to advise you through the process. Uh, there comes a transition time where once the publishing is done, we're no longer in the front seat, but we make sure, uh, unless you hire us to do the launch as well, which is a separate thing, but we make sure that you have the information you need and we make sure that you know what decisions to make and that what direction to go in. You know, a friend of mine talks about the fact that if, if you want to get to Baltimore, you, you want to have some directions. You want somebody to guide you. I can't just go to the end of my street and head out there and expect that I'm going to get to Baltimore. Even if I head south, I'm in Connecticut, even if I head south doesn't mean I'm going to get to Baltimore. <laughs> I need directions. And so what we try and do is make sure that as the author now takes over the responsibility for building their business with this book that we've helped them create, and the book is properly positioned and designed to be able to accomplish certain purposes. Now the author needs to take the steps necessary to make sure that the book is activated and used in such a way to accomplish those purposes. And so we, we continue to provide that guidance. That sounds uh, quite the mouthful. And you're absolutely <laughs> right. I mean, if, if, you, if you're in Connecticut and you want to get to Baltimore, you actually have to go west at some points to get around the city and <laughs> get bit, down yeah. there. <laughs> So it's not just South. I mean, that's the way you would think. Um, so it sounds to me, and correct me if I'm wrong here, it sounds to me I, that I'm you're I'm a offering, publisher, not a geography. Yeah, no, it sounds to me like you're offering, uh, you are the GPS really for the person who's trying to, you know, publish a book and get the book out there and build and also build a business, which is sort of mm -hmm. the more important piece rather than publishing, just thinking about the book as being the thing, because it's not the thing. It's the yep. vehicle. That gets you, yes. the, you know, the goals and the things that you really want, which is more consulting, more people on your mailing list, more people joining your Facebook group, uh, you know, mm -hmm. more people calling you. Maybe you've got group coaching going on. Uh, you want to fill those groups up and you can do this without selling 100,000 copies or a million copies of the book. Yep. That's the other thing people don't recognize. It's like, uh, you know, if the average book is selling 100 copies, people can still make money off that if it's the right sure. hundred people who are buying it. Exactly. Exactly. And, and oftentimes, you know, we encourage people to, to don't worry about giving your book away. Feel free to give it away. Uh, actually, one of the things we're, we're talking about doing uh, when we publish Publish with a Purpose is, um, you know, all these free plus shipping offers that people have these days. It's a mm -hmm. great way of building your mailing list. It's, it's somewhat of sleight of hand because it's, it's not really free. You're paying $7.95 typically for the book. For the author, it means that your print costs and your media mail shipping costs are typically covered. You may make you know, a few cents to a dollar on it as well. Um, but what we're talking about is maybe not just doing free plus shipping or, or we'll present it as free plus shipping, but we're thinking about sending two copies instead of one. And so the idea is the first copy is going to be for the person, but we're gonna include a note that says, we're so convinced that this is going to be a value to you and we really appreciate you taking the time to, to order this that we've sent a copy for your best friend most people if they've got a book in their hand people don't throw books away it, it doesn't happen very often <laughs> so i have a Boy, feeling that, that book true? is going to be given <laughs> given to somebody too right yeah because they're only <clears> going to keep two copies for so long and so gee if we send two copies how much further will that get our message out yeah, if they give it to the right person, you're absolutely right. It would it would have that that impact on there. I mm -hmm. like the idea. I like the idea. It's a, it's, yeah. it's you know again you're thinking outside the box here, not just a normal publisher. You're going, right. uh, you know, because you know. Let's explain that you do have a background in marketing. Yes. <laughs> right. I, I think that's the piece a lot of people kind of miss, and they say, "Well, you're just a publisher," but I think you're you're much more than that. And the reason that you're here is because you understand marketing. You and I can have a very deep, uh, intense marketing discussion. We could talk about funnels, and you're not going to get lost. You understand all no. of this stuff, and you've done no, them. And, and I've, I've 
done website design and, and social media and all that stuff right. as well as a number of our authors uh, will have us either redesign or develop a new website for them when the book is launching as well so that we can make sure that the branding is consistent all the way across. So yeah, we, we do understand all of this and, and we help put those things in place. So, you know, if somebody wants to have a funnel, they've never created one before, we help them map it out. We help them figure out what would be good components of their funnel. Uh, so that they're not just ending up with with a book because there's so much more you need to have in order to make the book accomplish its full potential. Right. So take us through the steps. Um, <clears throat> I got an idea for a book. I may have a title. I may not have a title. Uh, manuscript is, a, is another technical term that people may or may not know. What is a manuscript? So you may want to explain that. And let's walk through the steps of working with you. All right. So essentially, if somebody has a manuscript, which basically means they have a draft of what they think the book will be, uh, maybe they've written most of the content, but they don't know if they're done because they haven't quite figured out where to stop. Um, th th it happens oh, a lot. Oh boy, people, I can relate to that. <laughs> people either don't know where to stop or they should have stopped a long time ago. <laughs> um, that, that happens sometimes too. Um, so basically, they, they reach out to us. You know, the first thing we typically ask people to do is uh, fill out an application that we have. Uh, one, it, it helps us understand what it is you're trying to accomplish and helps us figure out if we're a good fit for even considering this book. Uh, the next thing is we'll evaluate the manuscript you have. If you don't have a manuscript yet, um, we'll ask maybe for an outline or a, a summary of what the book's going to cover or mm -hmm. something along those lines, just so that we have an idea of what what we're talking about here. So you're not looking uh, for a proposal like like Wiley wants a, a book proposal. You're not looking for that. No, I'm not okay. looking for a proposal. I'd much rather see the manuscript itself because as a hybrid publisher, um, we are service based. So we do get paid for the services that we render. Uh, most of it, it's kind of funny when we set our prices, it's all based around publishing the book. Uh, it's like the business coaching all gets thrown in for free. <laughs> it's just part of our model. <laughs> um, but I, I keep wondering if that should change, but right now that's the way it is. Uh, so when we set our pricing, we have to see the manuscript because I need to know, you know, what, what level of editing does it need? There's multiple levels of editing and you may have something that's just a line edit, meaning that it's a very simple, almost proofread type thing uh, that has already been edited multiple times. And I don't need to worry so much about comma placement as is there a typo someplace. Um, content edit is the next level up and that's where you're going to be looking at um, the commas, the grammar, all of that, make sure that that makes sense. Uh, the next level up is a development edit. Uh, development edit basically is looking at the book as a whole and making sure does it, does it flow. Um, so it's, it's, it includes the content edit, it includes the proofread, but is the logic in the book communicating what you want it to communicate? Or are there jumps or gaps that leave the reader confused? Uh, so we need to see the manuscript to be able to see the writing to see what level of edit it needs so that we know what to charge. So we go through this process where we evaluate the manuscript, we put together a proposal, we say these are the things we think your book needs. Uh, in the application, the author lets us know what form formats that they're hoping to have the book come out in. Uh, we're able to do it as uh, ebook, as paperback, as hardcover, as audiobook, and as large print. And we're actually encouraging a lot of people to do large print because uh, one book that we published recently, we find that uh, even though we anticipated a younger market, um, for every seven paperbacks that sell, we sell one large print. So having that additional format out there enables us to sell many more copies of the book than we would have otherwise. Uh, and it, it, it's a very, it doesn't take much to create a large print version and, once you've and, got everything yeah, in and that's, place. That's, that's one of the reasons that people want to work with you because you have those insights that I would have never known. I've never heard that. I never even heard of a large print book before. So here I'm learning something in my notes, right? <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> I'm learning something. And, and, you know, one out of seven is, is a significant percentage. Sure, sure yeah. it is. And, and all the large print is, is essentially all of the same content, but the book is, is reprinted with the font at a larger size. And it's intended for older people. Typically, a lot of baby boomers like to have, have you know, an older, uh, like to have the large print because it's easier on the eyes to read. Um, but 
it was kind of interesting to see with this particular book that we expected a younger market for how many large print books are being printed. If uh, we were to have a book that went purely to the baby boomer and older market, I'm really curious as to what those numbers would be. Uh, you know, it, it's like when people talk to bloggers and talk about find ways to repurpose your content, write something and use it as many ways as you possibly can. When we publish a book. We encourage publishing it in as many formats as possible. You've invested all of this time and effort into writing. It's taken you hours, weeks, months, whatever it might take. Some people years. One of our books, it took the author 12 years to write. Uh, you know, and, and so some, some you've invested a good amount of time. So you want to make it available in as, as many formats as possible so that you have all of those different touch points that people may come across the book and may consume it. Now, when it comes to the large print market, there are so few books that are done in large print. It means that people that need large print for reading pleasure don't have a lot of options. So suddenly your book on marketing may be one of only 10 books as opposed to one of 100 books that they have to choose from. So it, it gives you that much more visibility. So we, we consider all of those different things. Um, once we've decided what your manuscript needs in order to accomplish the goals and the different formats that you want, we put together a proposal that essentially says, here's what we recommend, here's the timing of things, and here's the cost involved. And if the person agrees to that and we sign the contract and everything else, then we get started. And we find that typically we're, we're four to six months uh, from the time we sign a contract until the time the book is ready to be published. And during that time, we're also doing all this, this coaching with you in terms of uh, your, your dear reader letter, your dear author letter, and, and getting your launch team together and, and setting up your reviewer campaign and getting your endorsers and all these other things that go into uh, setting up the book and, and successfully launching something that will help your business. You know, it's interesting. You said four to six months. I remember uh, writing the, the book for Wiley and when it was time to turn in the, the completed manuscript, all 16 chapters, and, and I, I turned them all into them. And then you don't hear from them for four to six months. Mm -hmm. you know, the book goes yep. into editing, it goes into formatting, it goes into who knows what. And um, apparently they, they needed that um, leeway for the uh, to get into the catalogs that were uh, sent through what is it? Not lightning source. Um, uh, doo -doo -doo. Ingram Spark. Ingram. Through Ingram. Ingram. Yep. They were sent through Ingram. And Ingram yep. needed a six-month lead time to be able to sell the book to the bookstores. Yes. So the, the book really sits on the shelf for a very long time before it's ready to be published. A lot of traditional yeah. publishers, uh, it, it'll be 12 to 18 months from yep. the time you submit your manuscript until the book actually comes out, if it comes out. Uh, because if they've decided that the market has changed and your book is no longer a, a title that they think will sell, they are not obligated to publish it. So they can have spent all that time on it, but not ever actually publish your book. Yeah, and I think in that case, you know, I would have probably gone back to them, bought the rights back from them, <laughs> you know, published it uh, myself because it, was, it did take a lot of work to do it. Yeah, but keep in mind, if you're using this book to build a business or a brand, it sat in limbo all that time. It you did, know. and it really didn't. And that's why I was saying four to six months seems, you know, somebody might be hearing that and saying, boy, that's a long time, but it really isn't. I mean, it's it's yes. really fast, fast paced compared to uh, working with a traditional publisher. Not to knock the traditional publisher, it's just a different system. But I yeah. really like, I like the fact that you're nimble. I like the fact that you're flexible. And I agree with you, the business coaching that's built in is brilliant um, because you're not going to get that. You do, you're certainly not going to get that from a traditional publisher. All they're mm -hmm. interested in is, did you turn in your manuscript on time? I mean, yep. that was the biggest thing with them. Are you going to make the deadline? Are you going to make the deadline? I was actually a week early. I'm going to make the deadline. Don't worry. I'm going to make the deadline. I committed to you. I will do it. Um, mm -hmm. But there really wasn't much in the way of coaching. There wasn't mm -hmm. much in the way of help. There was, oh, you have too many links in here. And I got to tell you something, I'm what happened with the, the editing process that really, I, I got the, the manuscript back from editing and I was supposed to go through it one more time. And they took about 10,000 words out of the book, <laughs> right? <clears throat> okay, no big deal. What they took out of the book was me. Ah, yep. Anything that was personality, anything that was a little humorous or a little quippy or a little, you know, which, was, which is who I am, mm -hmm. they removed mm -hmm. me from it and it became a textbook. Yeah. You know? 
that that's the challenge, uh, you know, because sometimes what happens when you're in the traditional publisher framework is you lose a lot of creative control. Yes. Uh, a lot of times you don't have much say in what the cover looks like. Um, what they decide needs to come out comes out. And suddenly this, this book that you've written with the intent of helping prospective customers or clients get to know who you are and what you have to offer suddenly denudes you and, and, and you, you, there's no personality in it. So you're not telling them anything that builds a relationship. And that, that's, that's, I feel so bad. You told me that story before and I yeah, felt bad. And it you. just, it just is. <laughs> and, and I went, I asked her, I asked my, my editor and she said, well, you can put that stuff back in if you really want to. But, you know, it, it, it kind of hampers the, the work that they'll do on their side if you put it in, if they decided to take it out. And they sent it to an editing house. So they didn't even edit mm-hmm. themselves. They sent it out to – they outsourced it. And these editors were given a framework. And I, I had the framework, so I knew what they were, they were looking at. And, yeah. you know, anything that didn't fit the framework was removed. Mm-hmm. And it's just like one of those things. It's like, well, what do you do? Do you, do you, do you spend the time and put all that stuff back in? or or not so i basically let it go the way it was and you know still a good book uh still came out nice but you know it was disappointing that like you said the creative control wasn't there and certainly no say at all on the cover yeah yeah so this is more fun i i I want you to explain one thing you brought up i want you to explain a little bit more you use the term i'm a hybrid publisher right Mm -hmm. So yes. let's talk a little bit more about that because we have traditional publishing, which for mm-hmm. some people is everything. It works great. Um, yep. Not so much for the entrepreneur, mm-hmm. but hybrid publisher. Talk about that a little bit. So hybrid publisher is kind of that middle ground between self-publishing, which we also talked about earlier, where you're doing everything on your own and maybe hiring out certain parts of it that you don't know how to do, but you're the project manager. You're the one responsible for all the details. And traditional publishers who do all of it for you, but you don't really have a lot of input. A hybrid publisher really is somebody that partners with you. Um, You're paying for services that they're they're doing. Uh, So, you know, one of the reasons that a traditional publisher's royalty share is so different is oftentimes they give you an advance. And that advance is based on what they project to be first year sales of the book. Right. And they're looking in that first year to recoup their costs because they're the ones who pay for the design, the editing, the printing, all of that. And so oftentimes you'll see a a 90-10 split where the traditional publisher keeps 90% and you get 10%. Um, When you're self-publishing, you get to keep 100% of the royalties, but all the expenses are yours. And figuring out how to do everything is yours. When you're in this hybrid publisher framework, what you're doing is you're paying for the services, the editing, the design, the printing, and there is a royalty share, but it's 50-50. But the reason that we do the royalty share is because of the additional things that we offer after the book is published. Uh, So we're doing Amazon advertising for our authors that we pay for. And so our share of the royalty payment covers that cost. Um, There's a lot of different things that we'll do in terms of making sure that our authors are aware of contests, interviews, Uh, different resources, tools that we see that we like that are coming out or a strategy they may want to try with their book. And so we're we're staying in contact and making sure that latest and greatest ideas that they can try with their book or may want to consider for their book, uh, they're learning about. So they're not having to invest their time as much as uh, to to keep up with how the industry is changing, uh, to figure out how to create more visibility for the book, because we're telling them what they need to do. So up to the point of the publishing the book, that service fee that they pay pays for our expertise because we're guiding them through the process. They're not having to figure it all out themselves. They're also having the benefit of having a publisher name on their book, which for a lot of retailers is important um, because we talked earlier about the ISBN number. Uh, That is a unique identifier for a book and the specific format of that book. So you'll have an ISBN for your paperback edition of your book. You'll have a different ISBN for the ebook version of the book and a different one for the large print version. So when a retailer looks at those ISBNs, part of that number is a unique identifier for the publisher. And so when they look up that portion of the ISBN, they can tell whether the publisher is a single title, single author publishing house, which is essentially what you are if you have... Uh, self-publish the book, 
or if it's multiple title, multiple author. The benefit of a retailer knowing that it's multiple titles, multiple authors that the, that publisher has handled is that they start to see uh, an understanding of the quality and design standards. Um, people can actually, retailers can look at a book and tell in 10 seconds or less whether or not it's self-published. Specifically because there are certain design standards that people that aren't in the industry aren't aware of. And so in quickly leafing through the book, they can tell whether or not the person designing this book knew what those standards were. And if they didn't, they don't have to look any further because they have a lot of other options they can go with. And they want to make sure that whatever they're putting on their bookshelves is something that their customers are going to be happy with. So they're not going to take a gamble on something that is not properly designed um, just because it's, it's too much of a risk. That is the reason to hire you. <laughs> right? I guess, truthfully, I mean, you know, you think you're all just going to self-publish it, but you're right. If you don't know the, the design standards, the layout, the formatting, the, the, the distance from the edge, you see some books sometimes, the, the copy goes right to the edge of the, the page, you know, and it's like there's no margin mm -hmm. or anything. And it's like, yeah, self-publishing. You just know it. You just see it. It's like yeah. it's not done right. You, know, you don't know. Maybe you can't put into words how it's not done right. You just know it's not done right. I'll tell you one of my biggest pet peeves, and it, it seems so small, but it's glaring to me every time I see it, is if you have written a nonfiction book, right, chapters start on the right-hand page. Even if the last page of the prior chapter ended on a right-hand page, you have a blank page on the left. Right. All right. There's a lot of people who don't know that and they self-publish a nonfiction book and the chapters just run one page after another. And I pick it up and I look at it and I've got a chapter starting on a left-hand page and it's like, oh no, baby, <laughs> that's just not right. You know, just... <laughs> the content may be great, but the book designer, they're not. <laughs> Do you have to put this page intentionally left blank? No, no. You know, it's like, as, a, as a matter of fact, you don't even put a header or footer on it. It's a totally blank page. Oh, I like it, yeah. God, that's funny. It's it's so true, though. I mean, you you can just tell when when a book isn't done right. It's just easy to see that kind of thing. And, and you know, the problem sometimes is you don't you don't want it to reflect on your brand. If you're using this to build your business, don't you want to reflect professionalism and quality? Absolutely, absolutely, you do. Yes, no question. So if you're tr trying to do something you don't know how to do, you don't know whether that professionalism and quality is there or not. But it reflects on your brand. You don't know because it's not your business to know, right? And exactly. and the truth of the matter is, it's like, uh, you know, an entrepreneur, uh, you know, is a French word. Uh, it comes from the, the verb entreprendre, which means to undertake. So you can you can extrapolate and say an entrepreneur is an undertaker. And one of the challenges with the undertaker, we undertake everything. We think we know it all and, and we have very broad knowledge, but not necessarily very deep knowledge. As and opposed that, to a mortician. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and I think that's the idea is like we may know something about self-publishing, but if the knowledge isn't deep enough in that area, yes. you know, this is this is your first your first interaction with a potential customer is this book. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and you want or a blog or or a podcast and you've got to come off as good as you can. You know, when I when I interview people, I always say you got to use a good camera. You got to use a good microphone. You've got the Yeti microphone there. You sound great. You got a great camera. You look great. You've got lights on. You look great. You know what I mean? And it's like people say, why do I have to go through all that? Well, you know, it's it's you know, you're going to be exposed through this uh, to a lot of new people and they want to see you in your best light, literally. right? And yes. the book is exactly the same thing. The book is your first impression and, and you don't get that second chance to make that first impression they look at the mm -hmm. book and they go yeah junk you know it's like it's just not done right they may not know right. I've, I've seen chapters start in the middle of pages mm -hmm. you know no break at all it's just end, ending one chapter next chapter yeah. and it's on the yeah. same page i'm like <laughs> really are, are, is is the paper expensive all of a sudden what what's the deal here <laughs> that that's uh one of the things i'm very curious about is is um amazon is shutting down create space are you aware of that I'm not aware of that, no. Okay, so so they're actually in the midst of uh, shutting down CreateSpace. So that's why the CreateSpace design services ended earlier this year. Uh, they send out an announcement to everyone who currently uses CreateSpace now that their titles are going to be migrated from CreateSpace, which is uh, how you list paperback books, print on demand on Amazon. Right. And they're going to use instead uh, KDP Direct. Now, 
or KDP, it's going to be KDP print. Uh, so KDP is the Amazon company that's used to put Kindle books on Amazon. Right. So right now you can upload a single source file for your Kindle and Amazon will offer to make a print book of it, which sounds really convenient. But the design of an ebook and the design of a print book Two different games, are drastically yeah. different. <laughs> And I'm just wondering how many people are taking the opportunity to create their print book from the same source, which would create the result you're talking about with a chapter starting in the middle of the page, <laughs> because in ebooks they can. <laughs> yeah, I, I remember uh, going back as far as 1999, Jeff Bezos talking about POD, print on demand, as mm -hmm. being the future. And back then it was like, what, what is he talking about? What do you mean print on demand? When I, when I get a book, I'm going to have, you know, 2,000 copies or 5,000 copies in my garage. I'm going to have boxes of books floor to ceiling that I need to sell. Um, mm -hmm. How many authors have gone through that in, in the past, you know? And he was talking about print on demand where a book would never go out of print. It would always be available because it would be a digital file. And when you ordered it, they would print it. It would flop out of a machine. They'd put it in a box and ship it to you. Yep. And and here we are, you know, we're, we're there. We, we live in that, that reality, but I agree with you. I mean, yeah, the, the formatting for an ebook is, yeah, it, it, it's really difficult because you never know what they're going to be reading it on. And, and, and yeah, and books, I tell you book production, that, that's another talk that I give sometimes is just explaining to people when you talk with a printer, they have a whole language of their own. And if you've never printed a book before beyond POD, uh, it's it's an alien world. Uh, I had to create a glossary for myself just so that I understood some of the conversations I was having with printers early on because it was like, I don't know what this means. You know, cover stock, <laughs> what's cover stock? Uh, you know, do I want a laminate? I don't even know what that means, you know? So having to figure that all out, case bound versus perfect bound, all of these things that if you did decide you wanted to order a bulk set of books, you would want to know. So the Danbury Fair book that we talked about earlier, you know, one of the things that the author really wanted was something that was a book people would want to hold on to. Uh, the book itself is 312 pages. It has 177 photographs from wow. throughout the years of the fair. Beautiful. Uh, so the fair went from 1869 to 1982. So it's a beautiful book. So he wanted a book that was produced in a way that acknowledged how great the content was. Right. Mm -hmm. So we ended up doing a hardcover book. We ended up doing a dust jacket, which is that removable outer right. paper. Mm -hmm. then, right? So a dust jacket. Uh, we ended up uh, doing gold foil stamp on the front cover so that if the dust jacket came off and you saw the canvas cover, you had uh, the title in gold foil on the front. It was absolutely beautiful. We also put in custom end papers, which is when you open the cover the pages that you see before you turn the first page. Uh, so the back side of the cover and that, that first page are referred to as end papers. And so what we did to create a custom one is we took a map of the last year of the fair so that you saw the entire layout of the fairgrounds and you could see where the different attractions were and stuff like that. So we put that as the end paper inside the book. So we spent a lot of time on just the production quality of the book and that's one of the things you lose when you're doing something with print on demand. Print on demand is easy to get out the door, but the reason that it's easy to get out the door is because you have no choices. You're not going to have custom end papers. You're not going to have gold foil stamping. Uh, the, the dust jacket you're going to have, you have minimal say on. Uh, so choosing the paper weight, the, the cover stock, uh, all these different things, you don't have a say in. And that's why they can do print on demand because it's one thing, it's cookie cutter. It's just different content they stick in there and you know they go from there. Everything's but, on buff paper when you do print on demand too, right? It's that, that, that yeah, kind of beige yeah. paper. You can't get pure white. <laughs> and, and I don't know. Uh, I see a lot of books that are done with create space and they just look like photocopies to me. Yes. They don't yep. look printed at all. I mean, I, I, my eye can tell the difference because I've been in the industry for so long. But, um, you know, yeah, I can tell the difference. All right, Tara. Yeah, especially you, if you want to have photographs in there, your create space, if you, if you have any photos. Oh, no, they, they're horrible. They are, they're, wow. yeah. 80 yeah. DPI or something is really bad. It's worse than yeah. <laughs> worse than web. Um, all right, let's let people know how they can get in touch with you, where you all want right, want so. them to go, and sure. uh, what the first steps are to work with you. Well, certainly, if they want to work with, I'll, I'll uh, start this backwards. If they want to work with us, they can always go to emeraldlakebooks.com/slash/application. 
uh, to fill out an application, tell us a bit about your idea and what you're hoping to accomplish. Uh, if you want to reach out directly to me uh, directly, you can go to Tara. You can email me at Tara at EmeraldLakeBooks.com. And we would love to speak to whoever is interested in having a conversation with us. Awesome. Here's the, the new author application. I really love the way you've got this laid out. It's so easy to see. Yeah. So you can see it's not a very difficult thing, not a very complex thing, just a bunch of questions to answer. Um, is this your first book? Yes or no? If not your first book, is it related to earlier books you've written? Good question. Um, you know, so the questions here are not difficult. Can you summarize your book in a few sentences? I think I can do that. When did you write your book? Uh, what are the three main objectives? This is good. Um, requested publishing date. How about tomorrow? No, that's not going to work. <laughs> and how big is your social platform? Very good questions. Uh, are these people likely to buy your book? Most people are going to say yes. That's the right the answer there. Um, tell us about your business. Well, this is good. These are good questions. This really makes you think. This is good. Um, who or what influenced you the most to reach out to Emerald Lake Books about publishing? There you go. It's going to be other for this one if they're, they're reading this. Yeah, absolutely. If, you're, if you answered referral, who referred you? You can use my name there. That'll be fine. Um, what appeals to you most? Uh, what is your budget? Um, and we had somebody put in $2 and it was like, well, <laughs> that's not going to get us very far at all. And, and, and this... Uh, hmm. It doesn't accurately reflect what you want the book to accomplish. So, well, yeah, and I think you need to look at this, uh, whatever, you know, because the budget here starts at, uh, you know, less than twenty five hundred, twenty five hundred and up up to thirty thousand dollars plus. And you really need to look at this in your business as an investment, not as an expense. Yes. And a yes. lot of people will look at this and put it in the expense column. And that's mm -hmm. the wrong place for it. Talk to your accountant about it. You know, the expense column is the wrong place for this because this is a marketing expense. This is, is a promotional expense. This is an expense that uh, handled with the right person and working with uh, Tara and her team uh, seems to make a lot of sense because there's so many pieces that are handled here that aren't. So, yeah, you're going to have to put a little bit of money down. But, you know, that's the, that you have to do that anyway. If you're going to if you're going to self-publish, you still have to put a lot of money down. And, you know, the problem with that is that you're trying to figure it out and feel your way in the dark because this is not area, an area of expertise that you've got. And that's really what I, I really love most about what you're offering here is that uh, you're giving people, you know, you're guiding, they're giving them guidance well and above just publishing. I mean, I really love the business coaching aspect to it. And like I said, you're working with somebody who not only uh, understands publishing and is a hybrid publisher, but also understands business, understands marketing, understands how to promote a book and uh, has done it many times before. So, yes. uh, yeah, it just makes a lot of sense. Remember, this is this is an investment in your company. And, uh, you know, it's like buying that next computer. I mean, you could do this for the cost of a new computer. And, and that's really where I would start thinking about it is, OK, you know, I know I need a new computer. I'm doing live streaming. I'm doing whatever. I need a new machine. Uh, it's going to cost me a couple thousand dollars, whatever it is. Why am I going to buy that? Well, because I know I can make money with it. I know I can continue doing my work. The book is exactly the same thing. It's exactly the same format of that. You're saying I'm going to get the book published. I'm going to work with Tara and her team because I need this book out there. And I know what's going to happen when I do that is it's going to bring me more business. Now, truthfully, for most of us, if we're doing consulting, no matter what we're investing in the book, it's one client. It's all you need yes. to generate to make that pay off. And, and that's the way I would look at it. That's why I put it in the, the uh, uh, you know, the investment column. It really is an investment in my business because if it gets me one more client, I've broken even, I've lost nothing. And if it gets me two clients, I'm ahead of the game. And, you know, my book did a lot more than that. I think I sold, um, if I remember the numbers correctly, last time I looked in Wiley, I think I sold 5,100 copies of Motivational Marketing. And, you know, I don't know. They told me, you know, the first time author 5,000 books was, you know, the expectations. So I just came a little bit over that. Um, mm -hmm. But it did really good for my business. I mean, it really helped me. It got me a lot of speaking engagements, a lot of new customers, and uh, certainly helped build my mailing list as well. So it is an investment. It is. Yeah, it is. Absolutely. All right. And so, don't, don't focus on how many copies of the book you have to sell. That's always the calculation we have to steer people away from. Yeah. So, well, if I spend 5,000 on this, I'm going to have to sell it, you know, 5,000 books. And it's like, no, how many clients do you need? <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's the exact and, and, question we ask. Yeah. And that, that is a better question to ask. And, and truthfully, if you only sold a hundred copies of the book or you, worse, you decided I'm not going to sell the book. I'm just going to give it away. Uh, it's easy to give a couple hundred copies away. Everyone, everyone wants a free book. 
And out of that, mm-hmm. if it if it converted one or two into a customer, you're ahead of the game. You're, you're yes. winning. Yeah. Yep. So, I love and it. you have the benefit of having clarified your message and being able to communicate to prospects more more articulately about what it is that you do and have to offer. And you because you spend so the much time that we began with, we began saying use your blog post to create your book, but you can yep. use the content in your book to create new blog posts. You got it right. And mm-hmm. you can create audio content and you can create videos and you, you know, it's like once you have that content and you flushed it out and you've got it clear, it could be the content you use for the next 10 years in your business. Mm-hmm. You know, yep. I, I have, I, I still use the content and motivational marketing in my speeches. When people invite me to come to seminars and such, they say, what are you going to talk about? I'm going to talk about motivational marketing. Why? Because I wrote the book on it. I'm the expert. You know? <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> and yep. it's content that never goes away. It never gets old. It is, it is, uh, it's been serving me well over the years and, and will continue to do so. So mm-hmm. Tara, I appreciate you. Thank you so much for, for sharing. And uh, just so people know, four pages of notes. <laughs> while, he was, while he was interviewing <laughs> while i was interviewing i was taking notes and i hope you were as well because uh tara's got some really great stuff to share and believe me we're just scratching the tip of the iceberg here there is a lot more i have had the the pleasure of spending time with her offline we've had uh different conference calls together i've interviewed her on coach's corner my my podcast and uh, she's just brilliant in in so many ways and uh, so blessed to have you on board today i really appreciate it thank you robert it's been All wonderful right. to be here Thank you. And uh, keep watching. There's more great presentations for you during the Marketing Thunder Conference. We're having a lot of fun here.